Disclaimer. We are two regular guys who love to talk Bone Thugs and Harmony. We do not represent Bone Thugs or any Bone affiliate. We are also not Bone Thugs experts. The views and information you hear in this podcast may be based on personal opinion. Please feel free to leave corrections and clarifying information in the comments. And enjoy. standard i think for you too i mean it, that's such a big record to say this is my first record that it, it really puts you up on a another tier um and and you wait know, are you saying that i ain't made nothing hot since i i'm <laughs> i'm saying that when you get a grand slam at your first time at plate that the expectation yeah, will be a grand slam that? every time <laughs> uh lucky for you you've been able to do it you've done it uh quite a few times and and not just with bone but but quite a few artists as well um one of the things that i i, I kind of picked out while i was reading your book uh, and this is just maybe a minor thing but when you were talking about that track you had said that mariah mentioned something about a thug line deal and that of course was crazy's label at the time that became the life sure. do you have any idea what that deal was that she was talking about was there going to be some sort of deal between crazy and mariah no thug line, dude thug line was a partnership between me and crazy Okay. Wow. Whoa. So crazy and so I that's were, that's new for did, me. Okay. We did. Thugline was a label. We did a distribution deal with yeah, Steve yeah. Rifkin. Yeah. And 100%. that's what. And that's what. Um, with the song "Boyfriend Girlfriend," which is another one of my favorites, that was yeah. on uh, the one where he has the military thing on the cover. What was that? Yeah, Thug on the Line. Yeah, Thug on the Line. Yeah, Thug on the Line. Thug on the Line. That was on through. That was through Thugline. Yeah. Oh yeah, so, no, I, I, mean, I know, I know that it was label. a label, but but I, I know that it was a label, uh, and it's been a label, and, and it was and a, a partnership a, between me and Crazy. So what was the, was was what was Mariah talking about? Was she gonna be with you guys on Thug Line? I mean, was that something that was looking like was gonna happen? Well, at that point, Mariah wanted to do anything that I was doing, not to be whatever, whatever, but yeah. she wanted to be a part of everything that I was doing because I was that bringing was, her back. Mm-hmm. That would have been wild. And I was protecting yeah. her at the time from Tommy Matola. Yeah. So, I mean, you know what I mean? There was nobody yeah. powerful enough to go against Tommy Matola for her. That, and I saw her through that time. It would have been wild to see uh, Mariah with the, with the TL. Uh, that, that video, yeah. of course, of, of also got filmed. Were, were you there when the I Still Believe video got filmed? Were you on set? You want to? I'll tell you something funny. I still believe they'll blow your mind. You know, and there's this one little clip where there's two Mexican guys leaning against a wall with sombreros on. Do you know uh-huh. that part? That's yes. me and Steve Lobel. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's me awesome. and Steve Lobel. <laughs> oh shit! And you know what's That's so good. funny is is then you know it was a really hot day. And you'll notice, like, I think there's two clips of it. There's one where there's two, and then there's one where there's one. Steve got really hot and got up and said, screw this, I'm done, walked away. And then Mariah's like, we've got to shoot one more scene. Damien, get back over there. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do recall it's your sh- Yeah, I do recall you in this now. Not, holy smokes. And, yeah. and you know what's yep. funny is Crazy and I ended up, you know, Crazy and I got in trouble at that video shoot, and Crazy and I disappeared with a couple of girls into one of the sets with a bottle of Hennessy and they were ready to start filming and we disappeared with the girls and Mariah started yelling and they finally found us. Uh. <laughs> so yes. Do, do you know, <laughs> do you know why, uh, 
what why is that video blocked on on YouTube in the United States? No no one in the United States can watch that. We as Bone fans all miss that video. That's like uh that's like a big one and none of us can watch it. Do you know why that's blocked in the United States but not in other countries? Probably because Mariah's mad at me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll take that. That's, <laughs> she don't. She don't, uh, take, that, she don't take too well. She don't take too well when people break up with her. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just me and yeah. Dan Peter. So what do you want? <laughs> hey. Well, then, then Demiza, you guys fault. got your answer. That Demiza uh, <laughs> is why we can't watch. I still believe. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I saw that. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say the, the parts in the book. their favorite record, so screw it. Yeah, oh, it's a fact. <laughs> I, I was definitely living vicariously uh, through you in the Mariah Carey chapter. I mean, you know, nothing nothing naughty happens, so but I. just, I, I was just like, man, <laughs> I, if I could just be Mariah Carey's pet dog. <laughs> and Dude, here's you know what's so a, funny, dog? Let, let me tell you a funny story, and this is just, you know, between us and the people listening. Dude, I remember... There's this one, the one day that I realized that I made it is I was laying in bed and I was at Mariah Carey's house and I look over and she's asleep next to me and I shit myself. I swear to God. I looked over. I'm like, who the fuck are you right now? What the fuck is this? Mariah Carey is half ass naked asleep on the bed next to you. Like, I'm sitting there going, like, what the hell is going – what dimension am I living in? You know what I mean? And then I get up, and I'm walking through her house, and I look over, and I see Marilyn Monroe's piano, and it had this rope around it so you couldn't, you know, touch it and play it. I move the rope, and I start playing on fucking Mariah's piano, or Marilyn Monroe's <laughs> piano. And I'm like, yo, you're playing Marilyn Monroe's piano in Mariah Carey's house, who you just woke up next to. Who are you right now? And then I pick up my phone. No, is it, this is a true story. So then I pick up my phone and there's a message from Jay-Z complaining about something. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> I thought it was a dream. I literally thought I was living in a dream. And I, 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 I got dressed because I did it in my boxes. Imagine playing Marilyn Monroe's piano on your block, boxes. And then freaking, you know, I went and got dressed, and I went down, I smoked some weed, and then I went downstairs, and I walked around the block and just took in New York. And I'm like, you're in New wow. York, and, like, it, 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 like, you're in with the queen of New York, the king of New York just called you, you know, I'm trying to put these two together. Oh, that's what he's complaining about. You didn't want to do the Mariah record. And I was like, damn, like, how am I going to get this done? And it just was a moment in time that I couldn't believe it. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, I can't, I can't, like, control this life. Like, there's no way to write this. You know what I mean? And I just want to share it and let people know that, like, this is, you know, consciousness, the way it works, is this manifest destiny. You can have anything you want in this matrix. All you got to do is believe it can happen because I am the proof of that. You can't tell me no. Oh. I'll find a way to get it done. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? and, and you did it over and over again uh, throughout the book. And the part that blew me the way the most, and it was so cinematic, was when you basically said goodbye to Mariah and you tell her yeah. she's asleep and you tell her that you love I, man. I, I, my heart was just so broken, but I thought you were such a good man to, to let her free, you know, to let. Uh, well, dude, you know, know what? That... I, the only thing I was thinking at the time when I said that was fall on the sword. That's what was playing in my head. Like, I get these things, like, it's weird about, you know, and I'm so glad I'm talking to you guys about this because not many people can grasp the consciousness thing. You know what I mean? Not many people really are in touch with themselves and are conscious enough to be awake. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they're drones. Absolutely. They just go through their lives, and it's on, it's on repeat. And it's the Truman Show. It's fucking Groundhog Day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's what they do. Look. But with me, it's, it's like, for instance, in, in that moment, it was like, you have to fall on the sword. They're punishing her because of you. You played your part. Now walk out. Yeah. And she didn't get it. You know what I mean? Because she lives in the moment. 
for, you know for what our I mean? listeners uh for our listeners can you can you kind of just let let them in on on what you mean by she she was paying for for you know you can you can i just kind of quickly bring them up to speed as to why you had to make that decision with with mariah for anybody that hasn't read the book well what happened was is after glitter and all of that and rebuilding her um i sent her to atlanta and i said making us your record and that was um the one that brought her back, uh, We Belong Together, which is actually about me. She says my name's an old damn record. The, um, wow. And uh, Don't Forget About Us and all that shit. And One and Only and all that. Um, but anyways, it, she, had, she was just about to come back. And all of the radio competitors, the beat, uh, said she was over and they wouldn't play her records because of our relationship. And a lot of the MTV and BET were, you know, talking about if the Miz is in the video, you know, we're not doing it. it was just weird stuff was happening. And was and this just because was, you were a competitor with, like, as far as being with power? Yes. So, you know, Kiss FM in Los Angeles, which is their bread and butter for something like that, said if I was involved, they wouldn't play the record. So I had to walk away. You know, and it, wow. and it's it's a that's what's so humbling. You know what I mean? Is I, I my life is phases. You know what I mean? That was like a phase. That was a moment. That was a scene where I played my part, and I got my curtain call. I took my bow and I walked out. You know, it's like for instance, if somebody was on stage, say an actor playing a lead part or a support part, because I'm a support guy. I'm not ever the lead. I'm always the support. You know what I mean? I come in, I do my job, I leave. But imagine if an actor came out and the lead came out and did their thing, and then the support act came out and said, hey, wait a minute. No, it's me. I did all this. How did it look? It, it's it's that it was, was so... Closed, everybody's walking out. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just that it's amazing that you, you didn't behave selfishly. Not that I believe in behaving selfishly. It's just that you were willing to do the right thing and it was at such a big cost. And, and you know what makes that's me upset, what really... though? You know what makes me really upset? And it's the only gripe I have with my entire life is people mistake me like that. They go, he's so selfish. He's so arrogant. Like, ah, you know, to say that or, you know, uh, to do that. or You know, it's like, dude, I've never done something for myself. I've always lived by the saying, I'm a humble servant to the music. That's it. I do what's right for the music when it tells me to do it. I have no control over this. So how can you say that? I've given my life to making things better for this format and genre. You wouldn't, some places wouldn't know what hip hop is if I didn't do what I did with, with Power 106. Can, we can you explain that? Format. Can, can, can you talk about that to the fans earlier? You know, John had made the comment to you that he felt like hip hop had changed a lot, especially hip hop radio when Demiza stepped away from it. Uh, I, you know, uh, especially since researching you, um, you know, I just feel like you don't get the credit that you deserve for, for transitioning and changing hip hop radio. Can you, can you just talk to the, to the beyond the harmony listeners about what it was that you did that changed uh, hip hop radio? Well, when I got into hip hop, they, they treated it, they said it was a fad, it was going to die. You know, after MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice, all that stuff, they were like, this format isn't going to last, it's just a phase, it'll go away. So when I started in hip-hop, you know, I was fighting against the man. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And when I got to Power 106 in Los Angeles, I was, I was taking really big chances. You know, for instance, you know, I wanted to play Ain't No Fun in Morning Drive. You know, they said, you can't play that, it costs too much. You know what I mean? I'm, so I made a crazy edit of it, you know, which is a version that's all over the world right now. But anyways, you know, I was doing things like that. So we as a team, big boy, shout out me, you know, Michelle Mercer, Rick Cummings, you know, uh, all of us, Steve Smith, Michael Newman, we applied all of these old radio tactics to hip hop. And we created a format called album orientated rap. Because the gold base or the old records weren't deep enough, like you could, like it was weird. Like I'd play first of the month, and then you'd play like Boys to Men, and it'd be like, what the hell? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So it was like, 
how do we do this? But nobody was asking those questions because they thought that rat was going to die. So when, when they do research or anything like that, they wouldn't put ain't no fun in there. But I grew up in hip hop. So I'm like, these are the passion records. People love these records. They should have been radio records because they were hits in the street. And so I'd apply that thinking. And that's what's missing in rap today is there's nobody that's acting as that connoisseur. They're just trying to do it for ratings. And the problem is, you know, it's like getting money. If you sit there and go, I'm going to go out and get money, you're not going to make no money. If you do what you love, the money will come. Hip-hop is the same way. Music is the same way. Life is the same way. So I just applied those things to radio, and it's not really what we played. It's what was in between. Power was my personality. So it was like an, on, it was an ongoing party. So it was like I would introduce Dre to Snoop, and then I'd take it to the radio station and put them on together. And that's what made it. It was a, it was a fan with a TV. It was like almost like, you know, showing – it was like my life on TV, but it was just radio. So it was my personality. It was my energy. And, you know, the best way to put it is like Big Bear at KCAQ said exactly what you said. Hip-hop died the day that I left. And the reason why was – he said it was my personality. Hip-hop had my personality because I brought everybody together. All this crap about people beefing and all that, for instance, East West be fine. Let's get some East Coast artists in here and kill that shit. You know what I'm saying? That's I think you also, um, I think you understand the moment, uh, and, and this is something that, that not enough people understand and we don't see enough today just in, in hip-hop in general, but but you understand how important a, a moment is. Dre and Snoop reuniting. When we saw Jay-Z and Nas, you know, after the beef, they were on stage together. These are moments, you know, when, when we see, just now DMX getting out, DMX is about to do a, a you know, a, a dark and hell is hot, re, you know, uh, tour to celebrate that and they're talking about a Rough Riders reunion these are the moments that you know we as fans live for and and I think that you yeah. understood that and you pushed for those things to happen because you knew they were important well, and, and somebody and look, had to make them happen those things happen every day there's just not somebody powerful enough to display it and I was just lucky to have a platform where I could share those moments that were happening on the radio in real time yeah you know what I'm saying? Like, I was a catalyst. You know, for instance, like, I've never looked at myself as, as anything other than a platform. You know, you look at Ja Rule in that interview on my Instagram, backslash the Miz uh, on Instagram, you see a clip of Ja Rule saying, nobody fucked with my shit. I broke in L.A. My boy the Miz just took the record and ran with it because I was a fan of the music. I heard Holla Holla and freaking lost it. You know what I mean? It's no different than Smoothie. It's no different with Ja. It's no different than any other artist that I've at Jay Z, you know, because that's why Dame Dash and I, you know, the last project we worked on, shout out Dame Dash, was breaking Jay Z. So it's nothing for me to go to Dame Dash and say, you need to work with Smoothie. You see what I'm saying? It's just another moment, and now you're seeing it online. On Hip Hop DX, is a great story about Justin, and he says, look, this is how it happened. You know what I mean? For so long, look, for so long, you know, he, for instance, what Smoothie said is, why is it an East Coast artist that says Demiza did this for me, but Eminem won't say that? Because their egos, look, the way that artists work is they, they have to feed their ego. They have to say it's because of me. You know, mm -hmm. Dre is not going to say, Snoop is not going to say, this white boy saved my career. And that's why Snoop has a problem with me. If I walk into a room, what happens to Snoop? He's got to oh. say, this is the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And it loses I, right. some of that. You know what I'm saying? One of the things and that we were talking about is... Himself. Are, They're are not we... that humble. Are, are we right now in music, are we missing out on we'll just use this as an example. Are we missing out on the next Eminem because we don't have a Demiza in, in power to, to break that person through? I wouldn't say it like that because it's like that would be arrogant for me to say. But I, I think we're missing more of the energy of Demiza or Damian Young. Because, look, Demiza is a character. People miss that. You know what I mean? I created the Demiza character so that I could do those things. When they told me that I couldn't,
produce. I, it was a persona. It was something different. It was a character. You know, getting drunk in the middle of the shows and not being able to finish stumbling off the stage. Was it, I got that from Dean Martin. You know, I met yeah. Dean Martin's roadie one time, and Dean Martin, the roadie, had, a, had told me, and I, was, I said, yo, he was always drunk during the show. He goes, that motherfucker was never drunk. He goes, what he'd do is take a glass, put water in it, splash a little Coke, and, walk, and then walk out. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, so I, I took those things, and I ran with it. Like, for instance, Mariah on What Would You Do said, okay, let's make a video now. You can really do this. And I'm like, that's not me. I don't want to be a star. It was embarrassing to me. That was a reference vocal I did for Shade Shice. He was supposed to do the whole record, and Shade said he didn't like the record. I wrote Shade's verse. You know what I mean? He was well, like, I don't want to do this. I don't like it. Well, re <laughs> regarding the egos, there's a question I, when I was reading. I didn't fully get. I kind of get it now. But uh, in the Jay-Z chapter, when you were trying to put Jay-Z and Mariah together, you said that like their egos wouldn't allow them to sit together. And... I don't fully understand why. Like, I don't interact with celebrities on a daily basis. So, like, like why could, why did you have to mediate that and even kind of like trick them to bring them together? Well, what happened was, is Jay Z was hot, but it was hard knock lifetime. So he was really hot on the street. He hadn't broken mm -hmm. into other regions like Singapore or you know, you know, uh, Asia, you know, uh, Africa, you know, just all the places that Mariah Carey touches. And Mariah was a pop star. And there was this whole thing about her doing rap records and how it was going to ruin her career. But what happened was, is, you know, Mariah is a genius of synergy marketing. You know, she is so, she, you'll notice that every time, like for instance, there's a picture with her and Cardi B now. It's like any time there's a, uh, a star that comes up that's new and hot, you'll see like Jennifer Lopez, Mariah Carey, you know, these kind of big artists, all of a sudden they'll do a song with the hottest person in the street. That's what keeps the brand going and keeps the younger people in line with their shit. You know what I'm saying? So, for instance, in that situation, Jay was hot on the street. She was a pop star. He said, I can't do it because she's pop and it'll affect my street shit. She said, I can't do it because it, it'll affect my pop shit. And I was sitting there going like, okay, how am I going to do this? So I was friends with Bolt, and every time I went to New York, uh, it would always be an event. Me, Funkmaster Flex, Mike Kaiser, uh, Kevin Lyles, Lior Cohen, Dame Dash, Jay-Z, Mariah. We'd all get together at different times and eat at a place called Mr. Chow's. So when I was going to go to New York, I said, all right, well, I'm going to get these two together. So I said, look, Mariah, meet me at 7 o'clock at Mr. Chow's. I told Jay-Z, meet me at 7.30 at Mr. Chow's. So I went over, and I was sitting there <laughs> with Mariah, and I'm like, look, I'm up to something. I'm just telling you right now. And she's like, Demiza, what the hell are you doing? Jay-Z walked in. She's like, oh, my God. So they all sit down at the table. I go over to the Jay-Z table, and Jay-Z knows exactly what I'm up to. And they're looking at me like, he's crazy. Like, what are you doing? I said, Mariah, come over here and sit down. And I sat, him, sat her down right next to Jay-Z. And I said, Jay-Z, this is Mariah. Mariah, this is Jay-Z. And DJ Clue and Dame Dash were there. And I said, Dame, Jay, you own Rockefeller. DJ Clue produced this record for Mariah. Jay-Z, you need to get on this. And Jay and Mariah told me their, their you know, issues. And I looked at Jay and I said, do you want to get into Singapore? Do you want to get into this market? Do you want to get into that market? And I looked at her and I said, do you want to get into Brooklyn? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, do you want to get into these places? And they both kind of went, yeah. So what happened that night is we went to a club in New York. It was me, her, Dame, Jay, Puffy, uh, Nas. Wow. And, and that's wow. so funny. It's right. They hate me now. Not that dude. I didn't see any of that. Because Nas and Puffy and I were holding crystal bottles arm in arm, like literally. Uh, Puffy was on one arm, Nas was on the other, and we were dancing to Hate Me Now on the table. <laughs> <laughs> With a bottle of crystal in my hand around Puffy's neck uh, that I took from him. And I took his Rolex, too, and I was raving it in the air and all this kind of crap. And so, I, I mean, at that moment, you know, I've had those moments, too, that are crazy. But, but we were all together. And in that moment, when I walked away to go freaking get crazy with Nas and Puffy, there was freaking 
Jay and Mariah talking in the club. And I looked across the club, and I'm like, damn, it's going to get done. But I had to leave early the next morning, so I jetted off, and they went to the studio. Oh. And that's how that record happened. Wow. Now, was speaking that of Jay. Same, real quick, was that the same night that, that I guess somebody wanted Snoop on it, and so you, you told Jay-Z you were going to call Snoop, and he's like, well, you can't just call him like that. And then you call Snoop and yeah. you put him on the phone with Jay-Z. Now, by any chance, did, did you get to see how Jay-Z broke the ice with Snoop? Because when I was reading it, I was like, gee, what do you, what do you say well, in your let, first – Well, this like, is what movie? happened. This is what happened. This is what was funny about it. He said, I want to meet Snoop Dogg. I want to talk to Snoop Dogg. I said, all right. I called Snoop. And I said, all right, yo, uh, this is the Mizzou, da, 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 da. Hold on. Here's Jay-Z. And Jay-Z hung up the phone. He goes, I can't just fucking talk to Snoop like that. <laughs> you know, I, I, you gonna put me on with Snoop like that? Dog, that's what's up. Like, how you gonna put me on the spot like that? <laughs> and I was like, whatever. So, so I didn't think anything of it. And then a couple weeks later, Jay calls me and he's like, dude, we, it's time to talk to Snoop. I want to bring him out. I'm doing Hot 97 Summer Jam, and I want to bring him out. And look, that was one of the things that killed the East West beef too. And he said, look, I want to bring Snoop out. And you know what a funny story about that was? Is I put him on the phone together, and Snoop was doing his little arrogant thing because he can be like that. And he was on the phone, and he says to Jay, yeah, just send the private jet, and I'll do that. And I was like, this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, and I was like, it's so important for hip-hop for this to happen, and this dick is making freaking. Like, this is great for hip-hop. Don't you get it? You know, but Snoop is like that. Like, even when we did Cry Baby, he's like, come to the house and do it. I'm like, your lazy ass won't even come to the studio? I'm paying you 250 grand to do this. You know what I mean? Like, you so, know, there's those moments, too. I don't want to talk shit, but that's kind of the way it is. Well, well, uh, well while we're on Jay-Z, I, I had two last questions about that chapter from the book. And, and okay. one of them was, Jay-Z, the, J, you put together Jay-Z with this beat that Nate Dogg was on. And Jay-Z liked yeah. it at the beginning, but then at the last minute, he wanted Nate Dogg removed from Wet Your Lips. And I'm thinking, who yeah. would want Nate Dogg removed from anything? Like, what? He just didn't what, like did, what he, he just... did. Oh. How could anybody not like Nate Dogg? I always wanted to do a record with Nate Dogg. He said, <laughs> and he goes, just take him off, and I'll use it for the blueprint or whatever that record was, or Black Album or something. And I was like, you want me to take a West Coast or And see, that was the problem at the time. That was a little arrogant of me. But I was, I was like such a West Coast guy. And, you know, breaking all of those stereotypes and doing all that on one side. But I still had this, like, I was real loyal to Nate Dogg. Nate Dogg, rest in peace, was a huge mentor for me. So I took it as disrespect. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, yo, you want me to take a West Coast artist off? And you're talking like that to me? Fuck you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I, you said you wanted the beat. Nate's on it. Get on this motherfucker and let's go. Well, I don't like what he's saying. Well, cool. I don't like what you're saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, well, and, I mean, and, now, and, now that, and now that I know that you have a, you know, a, a profound understanding of things, I was just curious that if you had this written specifically this way for like a, a double, triple entendre, you said, but when they separated and Jay-Z took over as president, this is the part about uh, Jay and, and Dame. When they separated and Jay-Z took over as president of Def Jam, the magic, as far as I'm concerned, went off into the ether. Now, the yeah. use of the words magic and ether, was that intentional or were you just using normal language? That was 100% what you think it was. Okay. <laughs> awesome. I knew it, man. That's great. I mean, you know, you talk about dimensions and shit. I get that shit. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like when – look, here's – to get weird on you, I, look, I live two lives. When I go to sleep and I'm, and I'm not conscious of this world, I know I'm doing something in another. Ah, right. And I just don't remember that. Now, and I was thinking to myself the other day, and this is the new thought that's been running in my head, is why don't I know what I'm doing when I go to sleep? Because I know it's a dimension transfer. And that's what dreams One-third are. of your life. Yeah, we you know spend one-third of our right. lives. One-third of our lives well, is spent dude, in the dream world. And, and that's the thing. Maybe we're conscious in another 
dimension or time zone or whatever when you go to sleep because that shit is magic. When you go to sleep, it's magic. Why do you go to sleep? You know what I mean? It's avatar. If you really think about it. And if you don't think uh, you can manipulate, I mean, if you go to, what, what's it called, Surdy or whatever the hell, in, uh, where they're smashing atoms and freaking... Oh, CERN. You yeah, know, CERN. CERN and all that kind of... If you don't think that they can freaking crack that shit, you're crazy. You have the freaking United States government with the military that's had close to 50 years of unlimited budgets and unlimited resources to sit there and mess with frequencies, consciousness. I mean, if you go to the Freedom for Information website, it's right there. If you go and look up consciousness on the CIA website, it'll give you a printout and the, the, the uh, report on consciousness. You can mm-hmm. mess with dimensions if you want to. You think you unintentionally have been messing with dimensions to create the, the great life that is Damien Young? You know what? I don't think it's messing with dimensions. and I don't think it's manipulation. What I really think is the power of Look, I'm going to say this right now, and I don't want you to like, think I'm crazy, but I will be president of the United States someday. Wow. Wow. <laughs> All right. I just you got my it. vote, man. No, I'm going to run be for on Congress campaign next, year, or next year. I'm going to run for Congress next year, just so you know. If not or next in year, Calif- the year after. In and California? Or? In my district. In my district. In Santa Barbara. Wow. Dude, that's awesome. And then take it from there. But, I, but look, there's something that, it's weird. Like I feel, I've always felt that my life will end up in the White House. You know what I'm oh. saying? And be, and bring people together. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I don't. Mm-hmm. And actually, I don't know if it'll be president, but it'll be something in that space. That that whether I'm the side guy or the guy next to the president, that explains how to bring people together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it was just a weird that I noticed... thing. So to answer your question, no, it's not that, but it is manifest destiny. It is if you go to the CIA website and you look up consciousness, it tells you that basically your world, you can uh, make it true whatever your dream is because the system, the way that it's set up is, is how do I word it? is subject to your drive. For instance, what, what happened with Smoothie, what happened with, with Justin and his dream of making it happen to get Kanye to freestyle on those beats, he never gave up and that was his main, he didn't let anything get in the way of that. You know what I mean? He kept going and kept going, kept going till it happened. And that's really what it is, is whatever this universe is, whatever God is, puts a thought in your head. And if he puts that thought in your head, then it can happen. It's just, I remember standing on my driveway and saying, God, I want to freaking work with Bone. I want to meet Michael Jackson. I want to work with this person. Blah, 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 blah. This is what I want. And I would say that every night. Pray it. Pray it. And it happened. I um, I noticed. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Cecil. I, I, I was going to say, I, I, I generally don't. Uh... Don't try to to do this to to guests and and I just let them uh, just uh, you know tell me their story. But your your story impacts me in such a big way that I actually have a story I want to tell you uh, that you know right. my our listeners have have heard it a few times, but I, I think that uh, it it'll be important and uh, it all has to do with what we're talking about. John and I are are big believers in exactly what you're saying. Uh, I I very much believe you you put it into the universe, you you believe it and and you uh, no, you believe it and practice it. Yeah, the universe it's, it is you. true. I, you know, <laughs> we we as people are are so powerful. And and my first real taste of this was, um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, very, very young kid, I I really got into into this, into Bone, and and just you know just loved their music. And I remember standing in my mother's uh, in my mother's kitchen, and I, and I would sit there and and I would perform these bone songs in my mother's kitchen and, and and I would just you know my whole family knew how much I was into it and and I remember my grandmother uh you know the the greatest just person to ever enter my life would would bring me to uh the the Sam Goody which was the local the the closest place where we could get records <laughs> Sam and, uh, Goody. 
<laughs> yeah, and and Gram, Grammy would bring me to Sam Goody to get bone, and and at that time I didn't even have a Walkman, so we were in her Cadillac, and and we would get the tapes, and That's and so as soon funny, as I'll my get it, had a Cadillac too. <laughs> yeah, you you when I read about your grandmother, it reminds me a lot uh, a lot about mine, and that's why I want to tell you this is. She she would let me listen. I, I would say, Grandma, I just got this, and I, and I just want to listen to it. And our house was like forty minutes away, and uh, you know, so she she would pop it in, and she didn't understand what I saw about you know Bone or or even rap, but 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 the she learned who Bone was because she remembered that they were the fast ones that that she couldn't understand. So out of all the rap <laughs> that I made her listen to, she knew Bone. Well, as I as I grew older, uh, what I do outside of this is, uh, you know, I, I run my own production company. I, I talent book. Um, I, I actually am an agent for, you know, just a couple local acts. And, and I used to be in an, a group myself. And, and we were uh, in a festival situation where we, where we got the opportunity to book Busy Bone. And, uh, you know, we, we ended up doing a song with Busy Bone as well. And when we brought him out to the show, I, I was able to negotiate uh hey if we do this song we need them to do it live with us and and they really pushed back on it because they were like busy doesn't want to learn new stuff and and i and i, and I just stayed true to i really need this to happen if we're, we're gonna do it and uh thankfully he did it and my grandmother was yeah. uh she had, was just about to turn 91 and my grandmother has well, seen everybody Elvis, the right Rat Pack. oh god bless her because it <laughs> you know so, l- luckily my you know my my um my grandmother saw so many amazing acts. I mean, <clears throat> Aerosmith, the Rolling Stones, Elvis. But the last thing that my grandmother saw was me perform with, with Busy Bone. And we moved her to the front of the stage in a golf cart. And she saw me perform with Busy Bone wow. uh, in front of her. And she remembered bringing that. me to get those tapes. And, and it's the last show. I w- I was, I'm so blessed that the last show out of everything she saw was to see me and Busy Bone and, and me to live that dream out. And I got that by putting that into the world and saying that's what I yeah. wanted. So your story reminds me so much about that. And I really felt like I had to tell you that because uh, it, it's so much. And like I said, when I read about your grandmother, it really, it reminds me of my, of Dude, let me, she, she pushed me let for me, this. Let me, let me say one thing. Let me give you one little thing. I totally identify with that because I remember this one day I was sick and I was home from school. And I was sick as hell, but the new Beastie Boys record came out, and I was flipping mm. out, and I was like, damn it, you know, License to Ill came out, oh my God, you know, today I'm sick, you know, I can't go anywhere, and I told my grandma, and I was so sad about it, she's like, and I remember her big yellow Cadillac, and she freaking <laughs> grabbed me and said, we're going to Sam Goody. And I was, wow. I was over the moon. And I remember uh, pulling in to Sam Goody and so happy and proud that my grandma was going to empower my musical bullshit. That she knew that as soon as I got that record, the house would be filled with that at a loud volume. And she put up with that. And I love my grandma so much because she, she never told me to turn it down. Yeah. Mine was you know, the same way. The she, she embraced my love the, for and it. The, and the Sirwin Vega B35 C's with 18-inch woofers and freaking turntables and playing it on a 45 and maximum volume in her living room. You know what I'm saying? And, <sighs> and just, this is your dream. I'm going to empower it. I mean, my grandma used to sleep in a parking lot at the radio station when I was 12 years old. You know, she wasn't yeah. just going to leave me at some radio station. So she slept in the parking lot while I did my thing. You know what I mean? That, like, part, that part really touched me when I read that. that, that I was yeah. like, I mean, wow. And it was after she worked two shifts. She worked like two yeah. shifts and then would drop you off at the radio station. I was like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, sleep, in, sleep in the car and then literally drop me off at the house and go to her next gig at 6 a.m. When- you know what I mean? When you like, talk about your grandmother, uh, you know, I, I, I hear you talk about the value she put into you. I, I remember, uh, <clears throat> I believe it was Edie I mean, you did an interview and you showed up in the suit and, and you, you know, you told him why it was important that you wore a suit. And, and I really can respect that the values that your, your grandmother gave you and, and just, uh, you know, the environment that she raised you in. When you transitioned into hip hop, was there a lot of you know, culture shock and a lot of adjustment for you from what grandma had taught you to, to kind of surviving in this jungle that we know is hip hop? Um, my grandma taught me not to be afraid of anything. 
you know, my grandma said, my grandma taught me how to interact with people. First, you mentioned Edie. I mean, first off, shout out to Edie and Sinatra. You know, that's management. So, you know, I, it's a respect thing. I love those guys. And Edie's yeah. a freaking legend. No matter how you look at it, hit him up, whatever, whatever. But he's taught me a lot. He's a great human being. Like when I told him that I want to run for Congress, <laughs> like he was like, you're crazy, but he came to the meetings. You know, when I went to D.C. with Sinatra, you know, manager extraordinaire, he introduced me to all of the D.C. people. People don't realize how powerful Sinatra and Edie are in this business. You know what I mean? They are great mentors. You know what I mean? You know, Sinatra is younger than me, but his passion is older than me. You know what I mean? Um, I I don't want to interrupt, but I just realized, I just realized just now you and I have met. And, and I just realized it, and I'm going to tell you how we've met and, and when this happened. And, mm-hmm. and you won't remember it, but I just realized. So when I was 17, uh, I got invited out to California, and I, I rocked a small tour with an artist named Juan G, W-O-N hyphen G. <laughs> and Juan G yeah. brought me to power, uh, out to power, and 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 I met the outlaws. I, I was, uh, spent a bunch of time around Edie I mean, and when he brought me out to power, I I just realized <clears throat> that I, I I met you. Well, I, I met a bunch a bunch of people while, while I was there. Uh, we were at Power for a couple hours, and I have to look through it now. I was just thinking about the pictures that were taken that day. I met Dave Chappelle that day as well, and uh, oh wow, I I Wait, fucking I met, met you in <laughs> inside of Power. <laughs> so that's crazy. I, I was just thinking power? about that. No, he, he. This was all in one day. Wan Ji had oh, whipped me like, around damn, everywhere. I don't even remember like, that. Yeah, no, this was like, uh, fuck, where was? We were probably at the mall when we met Dave Chappelle, and we had just left Power, and we'd spent a couple hours at Power, and I can't remember what his name was. Uh, and you're gonna know as soon as I describe him. He's a really big, tall guy, and he helped uh, on regulators. Um, he helped produce on regulators and I just met him, uh, outside of power 106 and, uh, oh. yeah, I was, I was 17. Um, Dude, see, dreams come true. Yeah. I, yeah. I spent a lot of time. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. You know what uh, the coolest, like, how that, that crossed reminds over me of a story. That reminds me of a story, a really cool story. If you don't mind, um, you know, Cassius, right? Yeah, absolutely. He was signed to Eminem. Yeah. And this is a crazy story. Like, okay. So. I'm, I, I, uh, I had a lot of problems with Eminem over the Mariah shit, and we were beefing kind of hard. And, you know, I didn't really know where it stood, but Young B was going to do a record with Cassius, a whole album. And they went and did that stuff, and, we, you know, we did it. I, I produced most of that stuff. Um, people really don't know. Young D, I trained too. So Young D used to sleep on my couch and recorded all of those mixtapes in my in my little brother's room, actually. Wow. And um, he says, yo, come to the studio and meet Cassius. I was a little nervous about it because I'm like, okay, Eminem and I don't really get along. How is Cassius and I going to get along? You know what I'm saying? Like, is he going to, you know, be, you know, kind of weird towards me because of Eminem and all this kind of stuff? Too shady, right, and, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I had done this beat that's on the uh that's on that mixtape i forgot the name of it oh cane route where it's like doom, doom, do, 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 like this you know eminem sounding record and he he he's it, it was weird you know i met him he's like look i'm gonna squash that shit between you and shady and i was like oh well thank you you know i didn't really think much about it or whatever whatever so some time goes by and on twitter uh cassius hits me up and he's like yo where do you live? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm, and he's like, what's your address? <laughs> and I'm like, why? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and he goes, I want to come up and see you. And I'm like, oh shit, here we go. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I cleared the house. I was just going to talk to a one-on-one as a man. You know what I mean? There was maybe one other person, two other people that lived here. You know what I mean? At grandma's house. And I was like, you know, fuck, it's going to go down. You know what I mean? I thought he was going to come talk to me about the JD shit. So he shows up, and, he, and the first thing I see is he gets out with his kids. And I'm like, okay. And he gets out with, like, burgers and stuff. They stopped it in and out down the street. He's like, you want something to eat? And I was like, 
okay, what's going on? You know what I mean? Like, you know, we're all sitting there at the table eating. You know, I'm like, okay, why are you here? You know what I mean? Like, you know, are you here to do a record? Like, like what's going on? And he pulls me aside and he goes, I wanted to talk to you. I said, about what? And he's like, I want to thank you. And I said, what? And he goes, I was hanging out with Corrupt one day. Corrupt says, we're going to go up to power and see Miss. I didn't know who that was. We get up there, and you're going through, you knew, and the Corrupt and I are really close. So, you know, I'm giving him shit. I know all the TriStar, you know, all the guys in the group, Roscoe, we basically raised, you know, all of this kind of crap. So I guess Cassius was standing in the back, and I'm like, who the fuck are you? And he goes, my name is Cassius. I said, what the fuck do you do? And he said, I'm all right. <laughs> and I said, all right, well, let me hear your shit. And he goes, I don't got it on me. And I said, don't ever come to a radio station and not have your shit. And I walked away. And he said that that moment inspired him and pushed him wow. to do better as a rapper. And he just came up to say thank you. Wow. And then he said, let's go do a record. So wow. a lot of those moments, yeah, I don't remember. Of meeting people and, you know, things like that. People are like, you're a dick. You don't remember me. Dude, do you know how many people I met with power? You know oh, I'm I mean? sure. Like, it must be crazy. You know, I mean, it, it was, was crazy, crazy. We just the day Adam I was there Levine. for a couple hours. We were watching Adam Levine on the Super Bowl. And it was funny because when Maroon 5 first came out, Craig, who was his bodyguard at the time, brought him up to power. So I was sitting there with Adam Levine, and he's like, apparently a shit. It's like kind of you know, up-tempo techno shit. And I was like, look, that's not really what we do, but the shit sounds really good. You're going to be a star. And he's like, you think so? I'm going to be a star? And now I'm watching him on the fucking Super Bowl. <laughs> you know what I mean? Crazy. So it's like, you know, it's you, um, moment. That, that, that must have happened so, and so, my listeners are going to kill me that I'm, I'm not jamming out all these bone questions I have, but, but that just sprung we'll get to me them. to say. I, you know, I got another, fi- that, I got another about 15, 20 minutes. So let's, that, let's wrap this up and let's get back in the bone and then, you know, <laughs> but let's knock it out. That that just sprung me to, you know, think that the way you just said that is uh, he, he must have repeatedly saw that happen so many times in your life. You know, somebody that was just whatever and, and then they're a superstar. Well, I mean, look at, look at Justin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you watch Justin now, he's going to be one of the hottest producers on the West Coast now. I mean, he's doing yeah. shit with Kanye. And that's just another moment where, look, I'm lucky, dude. I'm the guy you meet right before you blow up. That's the way it is. You know what I mean? I'm lucky enough to be that. If you ever listen to Six Feet Deep when I said, you know, the thing about, you know, because I could make or break your career, young dude. You know what I mean? Like, if you, if you can put up with my regimen and you can deal with me as hard as I am in training people, and it's like boxing, bro. That's the way it works. This is a training facility. If you can put up with the hits, I'll make you a star. If you are a star. Mm. But if you play That's that the game, big one. you ain't going to make it. But there's nobody. Look at Young D. Look at Ja Rule. Look at freaking Smoothie. Look at freaking any of them. Look at what happened when when we came in. Look at the Cassius thing. Look at any of them. There's just something magic in music that happens around me. It's not because of me. But I'm a conduit and, a, and an empath. I can sit there and tell you what you need to make it. If you're arrogant and you're not humble enough to take that and make it work, then you'll fuck yourself off. And it's not just in music. Like, there's so many other things and other people that I've helped accomplish their dream. But you don't hear about it because they're not famous. My gift is bringing people together. So I can sit there and go, smoothie, I'll introduce you to the sequence of events that will bring you to Kanye West if you can follow it and understand that it will take a year or two to do. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yes. A million percent. Uh, and I can it's... tell them straight up, look, it'll take you two years, it'll take you five years, it'll take you one year, but you got to do this. And I can see the whole path. That's the gift, is I can see someone's whole path if they follow the line. After talking to them for 15 minutes or so. 
It's just whether do they, do they want to listen. Something talks through me, bro. It's not, it, it's not me. I wish I could be as arrogant to say it's all me. You know what I mean? But I have this gift where someone can sit there and talk to me, and I go, all right, here's your path. And tell them how to win. It's a gift. Like, for instance, when I was doing the, uh, uh, the book stuff, and I was going on tour, I was doing all these universities and all this, I'd sit there and I'd look at the crowd and go, all right, you do this. I, well, you do this. You two talk. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And some of those people, you'll never know, but they made it. Wow. In different genres. You know, like an yeah. art guy that wants to do this. Okay, well, I'll connect you with this. You know, and that's like how, you know, just doing that kind of stuff is what got me to everybody from Stephen Greer on down. Wow. Because, because if you sit there and talk, and you can talk intelligently, and you're in touch and, with, and in tune with this universe, which I really am lucky enough to be, you can make anything happen. It all comes down to communication. All of it is communication and surrendering. And people have a problem with that word, surrender. So they'll never make it. Their ego gets in the way. The e- Look, there's three voices in your head. There's the good one. There's a bad one. The good one tells you where to go, and if you listen to it religiously, you will win. There's the bad one, which is the quick fix that has the long-term fuck-up. And then there's the middle voice that's you that negotiates the two. <laughs> you can sit there, and that's the ego. So if you can let your ego go and listen to the voice that's guiding you, you will win. It's just people don't trust that. And what people don't realize is that's the communication. There's something in this universe that tells you the right direction to go every step of the way. If you listen to it, it'll work. If you don't, you're going to fuck yourself off. One of the uh, your things... Silence, I know you, you know it's true. <laughs> oh, oh. It, like, like I said, it's a, it's a regular theme uh, between John and I that, that we talk about. And, and sometimes we feel like we are the, the crazy hosts for, for some of the shit that we say on here. Um, but it, it's amazing because more and more of our guests, uh, you know, identifies that. It, it's, it's weird how much in music we see the people that, that align and, and have those same views. Uh, I see in music a lot. Um, I, something well, I, and, I tell my and, listeners. And sorry, sorry to interrupt, but, but to, what you just said is really important. The thing, wrapping this back into Bone, the thing about Bone is they are the most intelligent and smartest motherfuckers on the planet. They look disjointed. They look this and that. It's because of the clash of creativity, their creativity is so deep and Mm. so great. You have to have somebody to negotiate it. And what's so dope is like, for instance, if you go back to the early production, you know who I'm talking about? Oh, you need. Come on, say it. Oh, come on, DJ Unique, of course. Kinu. Kinu genius. Unique is a fucking genius. And all I did was study Unique and follow it. I mean, I give the credit to Unique all the time. I'm just a carbon copy that, that freaking followed his plan. You know what I'm saying? And I told him that when I met him. And I wanted That's to what the we fans were want. Actually gonna do, we were actually going to do a record with me and Unique and both. Wow. And he sent me some beats, and we started the process, and then it all fell apart. But the problem is, is, is with Bone, you have to have somebody that they respect that sits in the room and says, okay, let's negotiate the creativity because it clashes in the room. You know what I mean? It's crazy with them because it's so, they have so many ideas that you have to edit them. You know what I'm saying? You have to reel them in. You have to direct them. Like more than thugs, people don't realize I pretty much wrote that record. You know, they wrote their verses and whatever, whatever, but the, the beginning of it, for instance, the the choke 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 and the mo thug mo thug all yeah that yeah stuff. Uh-huh. because remember mo thug you know lazy wasn't saying that shit no more you know what I mean so I I said look I want mo thug mo thug you know I this is me painting as a bone fan so I painted the picture of bone that's in my head yeah ah oh, so good so good but it, that, it, 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 it but that you bone, know 
It is. Most intelligent and, and, people on the planet. And Crazy Bone, look, Crazy Bone and Busy are the, the two that I know the best, and Lazy is my boy, too, and Wish, and, and I just met Flesh, and, and all of this kind of stuff. But, but Crazy is the leader. Crazy is a genius. Crazy yeah. was writing that double rap style on toilet paper in a fucking prison. You know what I mean? Like, that's how the style was created. You know, I asked him one time, how did you come up with this? And he goes, I was sitting in jail, and I'm writing on toilet paper, and I came up with the style. You know what I'm saying? And then everybody, all of his friends, his boys, Bone Thugs and Harmony, followed it. Beyond the harmony for the fans, we Join us. Be on the harmony for the fans we celebrate. Be on the harmony for the fans we celebrate. Be on the harmony for the fans we celebrate.